A Musical Life with choreographer and founder of Invertigo Dance Theater, Laura Carlin. Invertigo Dance Theater was recently named by Dance Spirit magazine as one of the top six trend-setting companies to watch in L.A. Founded by choreographer Laura Carlin, Invertigo uses dance to tell compelling stories and create deep connections with communities. One of the most fascinating aspects of Invertigo is that they perform with live musicians and even use musicians who double as dancers in their productions. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. One of my goals with this show is to bridge boundaries and showcase a wide variety of musical styles and perspectives. As a musician, it's easy to overlook the symbiotic relationship between music and the movement arts. To that end, I'm delighted to present this interview with Laura Carlin and my first inside look at the inner workings of a dance company, in Vertigo Dance Theater with their innovative use of live music and musicians as integral components of their performances. Let's start by listening to the opening track from their upcoming production of After It Happened, a piece inspired by the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake and set to premiere at the Ford Theater in Los Angeles this Friday, September the 30th. After it happened, everything changed. After it happened, entire buildings were gone. Markets were gone. People were gone. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Hugh. I think you have the distinct honor of being the very first dance company featured on the show. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> you know... Many, many moons ago, I had the incredible experience of working with the David Parsons Dance Company. Are you familiar with them? I am. David Parsons is, um, is an amazing choreographer. Incredible. And this was part of a summer arts festival, and several of my colleagues and I were playing live as they choreographed their music around our performance. And from that experience, I can tell you, I know how challenging it is for dancers to work with live musicians. In most companies, they work with 
pre-recorded tracks because the, the obviously the tracks don't change time. They they're, they're consistent. They're exactly the same every single time. But when you're playing with live musicians, first of all, the musicians have to learn not to play too fast, <laughs> otherwise the dancers trip. And the dancers also have to be much more keenly aware of the different musical inflections that can happen in a variety of ways from performance to performance. So one of the things I wanted to start off with, touching on your amazing a group, the Invertical Dance Theater, is the fact that you have live musicians. And in fact, not just live musicians, one of your musicians is also a dancer. She does double duty. So tell me a little bit what about why you decided to try to go with live dancers instead of just using pre-recorded tracks as most as many modern companies do. Um, well, I think that the uh, there's an amazing energy that live music brings to a performance mm. it's nothing like having um, a group of people on stage creating the whole experience there's something uh, really immersive and so magical about that and um i use music uh, i i definitely uh, am very musical in the way that um, i choreograph but to me, it is about that conversation, about that whole experience, as opposed to um, the dance perhaps uh, reflecting the music in a very particular way. So there's a little bit more give. There's a little bit more um, possibility within that. Um, so if the dancers know that there's cues, the dancers and musicians both obviously are very... Um, set on the cues that they need to hit, but there's an aliveness to it. We're not trying to create this exact same experience every time we perform. So um, yeah, it's it's tightly choreographed, but there's also that room for give for that, that incredible live experience that means that what you see as an audience member, that's the only time this is ever going to happen, this ephemeral uh, experience that we're sharing. And I think that there's something um, about live music that really heightens that. That sounds incredible. There's a there's a true synergy taking place between musicians and, and dancers. Uh, I'm also wondering, is the music scored in any way or is it improvised throughout the performance? No, it's, um, it's, uh, there, it's very rare that I put anything on stage uh, that is completely improvised. Uh, there might be uh, at the very least, there's a structure, um, but no, everything is composed and choreographed, but it's created, uh, we create both the music and the dance uh, out of collaboration and improvisation and, uh, and, and really exploring uh, whatever it is we're doing. So, so it, it has its roots in that uh, in the delight of improvisation, but then we, it has the refinement of that that can only usually be achieved with um, with composing and choreographing. Now, I noticed that you you're the dancer who does double duty as a musician and a dancer. Uh, this is Hyo yeah. Sin that she plays the cello, and I noticed in the photographs and videos that she plays in the traditional manner of sitting down and performing. Have you ever explored using the cello strap? This is an interesting device invented by Mike Block, a cellist who's part of Yo-Yo Ma's Silk Road mm. Ensemble, where you can actually carry the cello around and walk around while playing, and it sounds like that would be an ideal accessory for your cellist dancer to, to actually move while she's playing. Do you, have you looked into anything like that? Um, well, I'll see you the cello strap and raise you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Hayo Sun is, um, is an incredible member of our company. We're, we're really fortunate to have her. Um, and we're really fortunate to have um, a number, I mean, all of my dancers as well as my musicians um, everyone has a, a, a fluid role. I really take, um, <laughs> I take a lot of, um, a lot of what we do. And, and I look at, you know, we think of, um, the boundaries between musician and dancer and, uh, um, and actor. And I really look for people who, um, have the spirit of, uh, really working in between throughout, um, all of these, all of these talents. 
And so Hayosan um, happens to be trained both as a cellist and a dancer, and she, she's absolutely amazing. We actually created a piece that I would love to go further with. Um, we've, we've just begun to sketch it out. Um, right now it's just called the cello piece. Um, and we have Hayo, uh, we have another cellist, and we have a dancer. And Hayo san um, actually begins by playing the cello, and the other cellist comes in and takes over the bow, and then takes over the fingers, oh, and Nivet and she slips out, and he slips in, and um, he begins playing, you know, her cello, and then she picks up the other cello, and there's a dancer revealed behind it, um, and we end up doing all of these insane things like picking her up as she is <laughs> and carrying her around and, and she goes in between roles a lot, you know, even more fluidly. Um, so at one point she is on the back of one of the, of the dancer, um, lying down on this dancer's back as the dancer is walking along and she is playing. Wow. wow. <laughs> and, so I, um, and I have sort of a history of doing this to my musician. <laughs> <laughs> first pieces I ever made for Invertigo was um, based around um, based around Twelfth Night, which begins with a shipwreck. And so I have all of the musicians coming in, and um, they're they're playing their instruments, and it's this really ethereal, beautiful, um, strange shipwreck music that they're playing. Uh, and the they ha as they are walking in, the dancers are draped over their shoulders, um, or around their waists and so they, they um they're carrying the dancers as survivors of the shipwreck and oh, wow. 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 Um, and they did not know <laughs> coming <laughs> that first rehearsal that that was gonna happen um, so you know i'm i'm lucky in that uh, i'm lucky and, and careful in, in who i i curate into the room with me um i tend to look for people who will say yes to that um <laughs> but and then there's there's another piece that I, I think actually is online on youtube i'm not i'm not sure i can check but it's called saxy and it is a saxophone player and a dancer they are moving together and lifting each other and he's playing the whole time um i think she ends up playing a few notes as well <laughs> oh, wow. Fair to only torture the musicians, but it, it looks at the relationship of music and dance, and then also of musician and dancer, because you know we we sometimes forget that the people on stage are people; they're they're human people that are creating these um, these incredible experiences, and there there's a person behind that, and um, and so looking at the relationship of music and dance is one thing, but musician and dancer is another. Mm. Um, and actually, the upcoming show that we have after it happened, um, the musicians are characters just as much as, as the dancers are. Um, and, uh, and, and there is this fluidity of roles. And, and it really is all in the service of storytelling. Because I think that when we're, trying, when you're, we're telling stories, um, we become storytellers as opposed to dancers and musicians it's just all you know wrapped up in one mm. it, it, as musicians we are constantly looking for ways especially for the non-vocal musicians non-operatic musicians <laughs> we're looking for ways to tell musical stories without the use of language but using without the use of spoken language or right. words but trying to use the sounds and the ways we can manipulate those sounds and time and silence to try to evoke 
a narrative. And it sounds like there's a lot of common creative ground between what you're doing, calling your dancers not simply to dance, but also in many cases to act and in some and, and also to perform musically as well. So it sounds like everything's moving towards a very strong narrative spine in your creative work. Would that be an accurate description of what you what you're attempting? Yeah, that's um, that's a really beautiful way uh, to describe it. Actually, I think that the the biggest thing that that motivates um, that motivates us as artists is to is to communicate and is to connect. And um, and we've sometimes created these boundaries for ourselves uh, in how we do that. And so, in Vertigo, is is quite frequently looking to. Uh, to break those boundaries down a little bit. And we mess with uh, the fourth wall just as much as we mess with any boundaries that we have <laughs> between between the, the various artists on stage as well, because I really want the, the audience to feel that they're invited into the experience with us. Now, you had just mentioned the production of After It Happened, which is a story, a dance and musical story that follows how communities rebuild themselves and search for hope. And I, if I understand this correctly, this was inspired by the aftermath of the tragic earthquake that happened in Haiti and some photographs that you had seen of life after Haiti, the, the Haitian earthquake, about 10 or 12 months afterwards, and seeing these incredible images you know, you typically would think of images just of destroyed buildings and, and, and all this disaster, but you were drawn to the pictures of survival, these people creating new lives amidst all that they had lost and yet finding ways to play games, play sports, and even create fashion out of the materials they were able, able to get around them. Uh, tell us a little bit about after it happened, what inspired uh, you, the, the production and what it what you try to portray through this incredible, I'm going to say just artistic collage because it's not just dance, it's dance and music and so much more. Well, I think that you should come on board as one <laughs> of our uh, marketing. <laughs> like, you're, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, well, after it happened is uh, is a full evening work um, and it blends dance, theater. Uh, live music, as we've been talking about, we also have um, a few elements of puppetry and um, some rather um, interesting costume and set designs that that all blend together. And um, but at the core, it's all you know. Again, it's at the service of of telling stories. And when I say telling stories, it doesn't always, for me, mean um, as you would normally see a play, um, there is a, sort of a beginning, middle and end emotionally, but we're, we're not, um, fall, it's not always exactly literal. Um, so the story that we're telling here is, uh, the aftermath of a natural disaster. And so I'm, and following a community that, that is both traumatized and able to continue that there is the dark side and the trauma and the tragedy of what we experience in these situations. And also this incredible capacity we have for, as humans to not only survive, but to play, to fall in love, to hold one another up, to find hope. Um, and uh, this, the, the idea originally did come to me um, in a, a photo exhibit in Barcelona of the uh, about a year after the earthquake in Haiti uh, and I and I've done a lot of research and a lot of um, development following that so the the actual show is not based uh, in a specific it, it's not based in Haiti it's not based in you know in the, in New Orleans after Katrina or anything like that um, it, because I, I do think that this is in many ways a universal story and in many ways is a story that is increasingly being told, I think, with with shifts in, in climate and seeing, I think that it's just seeing the number of, of disasters it kind of feels maybe with social media that 
we're more aware of what's going on. Mm. Um, and so I think that it's a really relatable subject. We've all in some way dealt with loss, maybe not from a natural disaster, but to see a story told um, of how people deal with that and ultimately people being able to create hope, I think is, um, is both very honest, but also a little bit optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> well, I think, that, you know, I think that I wouldn't want to create a show that was just about the the hope. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't want to create a show that was just about the, the trauma and the loss. I think that these are all human experiences. We, But I, I really don't like um, seeing shows that stay on one note. So there's, uh, we, we like to hit a lot of different elements and perspectives of something. So this show is a lot funnier than the uh, subject matter would immediately lead you to think about. Uh, we tell some, we saw some really hilarious popsicle stick jokes about <laughs> natural disasters, for example. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's a little bit about, about the show. I actually think you did a better job summing it up. <laughs> well, I, I, it seems that you find tremendous artistic inspiration through tragedy. And I'm speaking both in a general sense and a very specific sense. And one of your projects is a Parkinson's outreach. And this really struck a chord with me in a sense that you're, you're reaching out to people who are in the process of losing control of their movement and giving them an opportunity to move and to express. They're losing expression, and yet you're reaching out to give expression back to them. Tell us a little bit about this incredible outreach project that you're doing. Uh, well, Dancing Through Parkinson's is one of Invertigo's engagement programs. So we have an education program, um, and then we have Dancing Through Parkinson's. And this is a program where we have four monthly and, or excuse me, four weekly and two monthly classes all over Los Angeles. And they're amazing. They're real dance classes. They're just modified uh, with the idea of, um, of the goals and the needs that someone with Parkinson's might have. So uh, we really make sure that they're, uh, challenging uh, and real, you know, based in, in what you would expect in any real dance class that, that in Vertigo would teach, certainly. But they also are designed to be really accessible. Mm. So we, we balance that. And I have to tell you, Hugh, they are so joyful mm. and completely wonderful. Um, I, it's usually the high point. Any, any week that I can teach more than one class, I really like doing that. Um, they're all taught by real, by, uh, professional dancers, uh, in, in Vertigo and in the, the professional community. We've been doing it for five and a half years and we really, you know, I really believe that dance is for everybody, that dance is not reserved for, um, people who think, of, you know, who we think of as the elite among movers, um, I, I certainly love dancing with someone who comes in and says, well, I'm not a dancer and I've never taken a class. Um, and, and so I don't know if I'm, I'm going to come back, but I'll try it out this once. And, <laughs> realize, you know, very quickly that this is for them that you, if you come to our class, you're a dancer. Um, if you're just moving through the world, you're a dancer. And, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's, I think, the beauty of the program um, is it, it takes away this spectrum that we think of um, or, or the judgment we have around what is, quote unquote, good and bad movement. Mm. It's perhaps one of the tragedies of our modern age, particularly in the arts, that so many of us are so segmented. I mean, within the music world, we have such delineations between composers and performers. And of course, we, we've lost in many cases performers or musicians in general dancing. And this was something that used to be part of everybody. Everybody would make music and everybody would dance. And at the time of this interview, just a, what, a week or so ago, I was working at a summer music festival. And one of the final classes, I was determined 
to work with some of my kids and I taught them the box waltz. Now I have to preface this, I am not a dancer by any means. And I, I, gra- oh, I grabbed some, are. I grabbed some. Oh, <laughs> <are>. <laughs> well, okay, but uh, so, but I, I grabbed some quick lessons from YouTube. <laughs> I, I had taken a few ballroom dance lessons myself, but the joy, the pure joy of seeing those kids learn to follow the beat with more than just their fingers, but just to move in time and just the exhilaration. Uh, it got me thinking, we really need to be, dance needs to be an integral part of every musician's education. And I'm surprised that it's not more so today. Do you think you could speak a little bit to why do you think there's been such a separation between the arts, or across the arts, and uh, the amazing ways that you're actually, in, in your way, bringing them back together? Uh, well, I think that in many ways, we've gotten more and more specific with our skill sets. I think that there's uh, a lot of emphasis placed on virtuosity. Mm. And in order to become truly great at something, you have to do pretty much that. Um, and, and we've gotten really good at being specialists which is wonderful. We need specialists and and it's a a great thing to be. But I think one of the most amazing things about music, about dance, about the arts is that um, in most cases, it is about creating connection and ultimately about creating uh, or, or cultivating empathy. And so when you as a musician are playing something and you're seeing dancers respond to it, there's an empathic connection there. When you're an audience member seeing all of this play out, there's an empathic connection. And when you as a musician understand what it takes to do even, you know, something as simple as the box step waltz, um, you know, and then going even further into some of the other things, if you understand kinesthetically like in your body what is that costing the dancer what kind of skills are the dancer is the dancer utilizing i think it makes you better as a musician and vice versa with with dancers you know you can really tell the the artists the the dance artists who um who have a musical intelligence and um and so it's i think it's really important to to have, at the very least, an understanding of what people in other disciplines are are creating and and what their world just feels like. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and so I think that sometimes in the pursuit of of virtuosity and, and specialization, um, sometimes the bigger picture gets a little bit lost. And also, I'll tell you, the language is really different. So the music... The, the the composer I work with most often is actually my brother. Ah, interesting. He he performs with you. I see videos of him. His name is Toby. Is that right? He plays the guitar, electric guitar. He plays twenty six instruments. Oh, like, oh my goodness! Wow. Right? <laughs> like, it's it's kind of mind blowing. Um, and he's really good at a lot of them. Oh um, man, I'm jealous. I've actually recently, <laughs> um, I have recently started to try and learn cello. Um. I can play four notes, not well, um, but you know, that open string, I can, I can maybe find it. Um, <laughs> so I do have a real, and, and, you know, I do have a real empathy, uh, for that, uh, for how hard it is. And, um, and Toby is, is incredible because he creates entire worlds with, um, various instruments and looping, looping pedals and an, an entire, uh, thing of switches and th- knobs and, I don't even know what it is, <laughs> um, but uh, he and I uh, have been working together for 10, 10 almost 11 years now, I think, uh, and we've really had to develop a language of when I say something, is he hearing what it is I'm saying, or is does do the words mean something different to him? Like, does it mean something different to him? If I talk about the tone of the piece, you know, and does his language as a musician um, take us in a different direction? And so we've really had to um, learn how to communicate with one another 
between disciplines. And that, um, that takes a lot of patience. And, you know, I don't know if the family bond helps or hinders in this case, but, um, but it's kind of great to have someone where you do have this common language. And anytime you're collaborating as a choreographer, if you're collaborating with a composer, or if you're bringing visual artists in, everyone has to learn how to speak the language to one another. Mm. Um, and sometimes you get very lucky and you find people with whom that adjustment is really easy. And sometimes it's a challenge and I, I, and we're creating art. There's a lot of, there's a lot of feelings. There's a lot of, there's a lot at stake for us because we, you know, this is, this all feels so vulnerable and personal. Um, and so I think that, that sometimes that I can imagine that would be um, really challenging, you know, when we talk about why people don't uh, cross these discipline boundaries more often, it may be because that's such a vulnerable, um, kind of scary place to go sometimes. Mm -hmm. But boy, when it works, it is so magical. And, and when you find people who are excited to create that vision together, I think it can only serve to really enhance what we do as artists and what we share with audiences and how we tell stories. I'd like to step back for a bit, Laura. I'm hearing a beautiful lilt in your accent. Would you mind sharing where do you originally come from? Sure. Uh, I was born in Los Angeles. My whole family is British, um, uh, English, Welsh, and I think a little bit of Scottish. And um, so, yeah, I just tell people I'm pretentious. <laughs> um, born in L.A. and yet you still retain some of the British... Uh, lilt in I, your in your in, in some of the words it's very beautiful oh thank you very much that's very kind of you to say um i I'm, I'm think that i'm one of those uh hybrids that no one can quite pen, pin down and it probably annoys <laughs> a lot of, it probably annoys a lot of people but it's very oh no 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 oh no oh my goodness it makes, <laughs> it makes me jealous i'm gonna start talking like you if i can <laughs> oh, no, i was just thinking you've got a really lovely voice oh, um, thank you. and i can see your picture on skype so you definitely you, know, you could do like a and video podcast. I was, <laughs> oh, I stop. Have, oh, stop. Oh, stop. Oh, stop. I was like, I have a voice for a dancer and a face for radio. So <laughs> well, th tell us a little bit about how you got inspired to start a dance company. It's challenging enough to make a living as an artist, as a musician, as a dancer, to join an orchestra, to join a dance company, and yeah, just to start your awesome. own. My goodness. That is a huge challenge. What? Tell us a little bit about the genesis of the Invertigo Dance Theater. Is this your first dance company that you've started yourself? Or uh, tell us a little yeah, bit about yeah, how this I all began. Started, well, it, it's definitely the first uh, real life one. I think I started many when I was a, a child. But, <laughs> um, but those are all in my living room, and I don't think they really counted. Um, so I, I started uh, in Vertigo when I was 23 or 24. So, um, so it's a, a fairly young age to begin a company. Um, and it is a ridiculous life decision to make um, to start a nonprofit at that age. But, um, but I did. <laughs> um, 
uh, the main things, there, there were a few main things that I, I cared really passionately about. Um, and one was the kind of storytelling that we're talking about, this um, transdisciplinary um, encompassing storytelling that I wanted to do that's really rooted in um, very athletic, virtuosic, um, kinetically driven dance, but with this theatrical, um, the theatrical nuance um, and these theatrical devices, I really wanted to make dance that connected with people and that brings people in and balances being accessible with being really rich and thought provoking and compelling. And so there was the art that I wanted to make. There was the people that I wanted to make it with. So um, I care deeply about paying dancers uh, and artists in general. Um, and so I wanted to create something beyond myself as an independent choreographer. I wanted to create an institution that would allow me uh, the infrastructure to, um, to, to support the artists that uh, are in my world. And, and I think that that is uh, underemphasized in our fields. I'm sure you come across this all the time, but we love what we do. And a lot of people expect that to pay bills and yes. it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and I think that especially with dance, like your body is, your body is your canvas is, is your art. And, um, and I think that that gets taken advantage of a lot, um, by, by some people. So, so that was another thing that I wanted to, to start a company to, uh, address and, um, and I think also I didn't want to wait for, as a choreographer, I didn't want to wait for someone to give me opportunities, <laughs> which sounds... Um, sounds very entrepreneurial. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um, I, I think that I, I am a first child in a family of, you know, my, both my parents are first children. We suck at working for yeah. other <laughs> You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think there are, there are people out in the world that, that, um, that are like this with, where um, I think it's, it's a matter of really wanting to do things on your own terms. You know, I'd worked for, for a few other companies and it's, um, and it's hard when, when you have a very particular point of view and you want to, um, and you want to do things as well as you can and you want to do things on your own terms. I didn't want to wait for someone to offer me a commission or to decide that I was good enough. I wanted to, um, I wanted to make things happen. So if you don't oh, yeah. mind, yeah, if you don't mind me interrupting, I mean, that all sounds well and good. I'm, I'm trying to place myself, uh, I'm, I'm trying to place myself in the shoes of a dancer who is thinking like you and thinking, you know, I want to start my own company. I want to pay the dancers. I want to, you know, be able right. to do all these yeah. amazing, how in the world, <laughs> uh, unless you won the Powerball ticket, a lottery ticket, how in the world did you get started? I mean, beyond, and especially at such a young age, it's a very precocious dream. But what are the what were some of the nuts and bolts that made that into reality? Because starting a nonprofit is you know, it's a time consuming. It's not a cheap endeavor. I mean, just the legal fees themselves and getting a board together and then incorporating. Uh, tell tell us a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts of sure. going from bridging the dream to seeing it <laughs> actually <laughs> seeing that actual incorporation letter in your hand. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you know, and it really, I think that in, in beginning with the why I started the company is really important because that becomes your mission statement mm. and your mission statement, um, is the heart of you know, your mission sta statement and, and eventually your vision statement, I guess. Um, but these are, this is the heart of, of how you talk about what you do and how you communicate your ideas and, um, and the value because going through, I'll tell you as as the artistic director and as, as a choreographer, just in general, the question you're going to be asked, uh, whether explicitly or just inferred is why you, why mm. this, why now, why is this crucial? Um, and so having your mission statement, being really clear about that is, um, is uh, the first step because it's what, it's how you convince someone to be on your board. 
It is how you convince the IRS that they should give you that paperwork. And um, it's how you um, comfort yourself when 25 people have said no to you or something has gone wrong and it's three in the morning and you are tired and you have to get up at six the next morning to you know keep going. So knowing the heartbeat of what you do is, is pretty important. And then there's nuts and bolts. I mean, if you want to start something, but you're not entirely sure that you just don't know in the beginning, you don't need to begin as a, a nonprofit right away. You can do a fiscal receivership, um, which is an umbrella um, organization that, um, that you, you know, will basically help you to, to begin that. So looking into fiscal receiverships is a great first step. Um, they sort of act like the nonprofit corporation on your behalf yeah, so that you don't they, have to deal with the paperwork, but that you can still receive the donations. The, right, the, you can the still have those tax write-offs. Right? Write That's, mm-hmm. you know, the big thing, I guess. And now more than ever, actually, I think that um, there's so many tools at everyone's um, at everyone's fingertips, um, you have this embarrassment of, of riches when it comes to, you know, there's Kickstarter and GoFundMe. There's a real like culture now of peers, of peer support, which was kind of around 10 or 11 years ago, but has exploded in the last, you know, really seven or eight years, I think. Um, and I think that, you know, you know, building up, you know, if you want to begin, start with your ideas figure out how to communicate that, get some amazing documentation of photographs or video of anything you have done or, you know, get put a photo shoot or a video shoot together and do something, put something out in the world that can be your work sample, that can be your calling card, that can show the potential of what you can do and what you plan to do. Mm. Um, So begin, you know, and, and, I made up in vertigo. Like I pretended it was real. I gave it a name. I gave it a mission statement and I sort of, um, I pretended, I I pretended we were two steps ahead of where we, where we were. And, um, and eventually people believed me (laughs) and and believing me, eventually we took those steps forward and got to two steps away from where we were. And by that time I was already pretending we were another two steps ahead and eventually we got there. And so it's kind of a continual, um, invocation of what we're doing. Um, and a lot of planning. Um, I would say that the biggest thing to do is, Find someone who's done what anything close to what you want to do and ask them for advice and take their advice with a grain of salt because everyone's journey is different. But do your homework and um, and yeah, I guess email me. (laughs) (laughs) Tell you you more. But um, I'm not sure I should put that open call out to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, 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 in the beginning, I talked to a lot of people and I asked a lot of people a lot of questions. And some of it worked out and some of it didn't. But it was all really valuable perspectives. And I both continue to ask a lot of people a lot of questions. And I believe very strongly in... Um, in being that ambassador or that resource anytime I can for anyone who's a couple, you know, a couple steps behind. I think it's all about reaching forward to where you want to go and then looking back and helping people get to where they, they want to go. So if you don't mind me asking, would you be able to share the approximate ratio of your operating budget? And now I understand that last year, in Vertical Dance Theater received over 380 individual donations, which is remarkable uh, for a nonprofit company. Uh, I'm wondering if you could share the approximate ratio between individual donations as opposed to, say, ticket sales or grants or other forms of sponsorship. Would you be comfortable sharing some of those numbers, just the approximate percentages? Oh, it's going to be approximate, Hugh. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it changes year to year, too. Uh, but, well, it changes year to year. Um, and uh, this is uh, also a question that would be great for my executive director to answer. But I will um, I'll break it down, and I, I hope that I won't receive an email in a few days. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I think this is pretty accurate. So we are um, about 65 
to 70% um, funded by individual donations. We're kind of like NPR, you know, like listeners like you. <laughs> um, and we're really lucky um, and in how our, our donors break down. We have a lot of donors who give, uh, you know, I think our, the, the smallest donation we've ever had was I think like a dollar and 25 cents <laughs> like, sent it in an envelope. It's just like, I'm not sure it's covered the postage for the thank you letter. Um, but we, we have smaller donors, um, and you know, normally in, in sort of the 20, $25 range. Um, and then we have donors who are able to give more than that. And, um, and every single one of them is, is really the lifeblood of, of what we're able to do. Um, so we, we really, um, we're really so grateful to the donors that make it possible. And, um, then we have, and so that's about 65, 70% of, of our income. Then we have about 10% that would be donation or sorry, not donations would be, uh, considered quote unquote earned income. And I really object to that phrase. Cause I'm like, I don't know if it all feels real earned to me. <laughs> <laughs> You ever written a grant application? Jeesh. Um, but <laughs> income would be ticket sales, commissions, um, class fees, uh, things like that. And and so that would be um, that would be about ten percent. And then we have another ten percent that would uh, ten or fifteen percent that would be grants. Um, and we have grants from foundations and then city, county and state funding. Um, and the state funding comes from the NEA as well. Mm. So, um, so we have that and then we, uh, and foundations, we have, um, private foundations that, uh, that we've applied to. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where, where we're at. We have, um, foundation, government, um, individuals and, um, I'm sure I'm missing a category, but, but that's pretty much how great. Oh, and earned income. Um, what was it like in those early years when you were just getting started? How were you able to grow such a strong base of supporters? And again, it, it, the grants, the, the other state and, and government organizations are one thing, but to grow a, a, a family of people who love what you do mm -hmm. and support you, that still, it takes a tremendous amount of work, connection, community outreach. What were some of the ways that, in which you were able to grow your base of supporters? Because they, as you say, they are really the, the lifeblood of any arts organization. And we really do consider them family. We consider the people who, anyone who comes to a Dancing Through Parkinson's class, anyone who writes that $10 check, um, and, and anyone who comes into the rehearsal room, um, these, these are all part of the Invertigo family. And that, that's part of the, that's part of our company culture. Um, we're very open about what we do and how we do it. And, um, and we really want people to feel included in that process. So, you know, I have a gen, I have a very, um, welcoming culture and rehearsal. So, you know, donors are always welcome to come to a rehearsal, um, come to the office and see what, <laughs> see what, what we're up to. Um, and in the beginning, you know, it's, you talk about, you know, what would the person listening who wants to start their own thing do? I mean, in the beginning, it, it is to a certain extent, family and friends, um, and, and anyone else whose attention you can, you can catch. Um, and you have to make sure to really thank everyone who is involved. I think that follow-up is the least emphasized uh, skill and, um, and necessity in running any business. Um, and so we're really, um, we're just really committed to follow up. Anyone who donates anything to the company gets a handwritten thank you note. Um, and, and it's, you, you know, it's not an intern writing it. It's, what, um, it's, it's me or, or our executive director, mm. um, or a board member. And it's, it's personal. Um, so we, we really do make it very personal because someone choosing to invest in, in Vertigo, um, that's a really personal decision. Laura, this is all so incredibly exciting. And just I want to congratulate you on putting together your dream, really putting together an incredible company of creative artists and collaborators and connecting with your community in such 
deep, profound, and meaningful ways. Could you share what are some of the future plans and projects and ways that Invertigo Dance Theater plans to grow? Um, well, I will email you our 10 year plan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if the most immediate is a week from today. Uh, so on Monday, August 8th, we are opening a new piece at the Music Center in Los Angeles. And we're part, uh, it's a commission called Moves After Dark. And it's a site specific work that will be performed. Um, and we, Got to cho- as a as one of the commission choreographers, I got to choose any site I wanted in the music center. So I chose the seats of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. Um, it's this big, beautiful sea of red seats, and the dancers will be appearing and disappearing and leaping and balancing um, in the seats, and oh, it, wow. the audience and the audience will be uh, on stage. <laughs> um, it'll be um, in a place that's very familiar to you. They'll actually be in the orchestra pit, but it'll be slightly raised. So they are in a performing area. Um, and so I'm really excited about that show. It's called House Lights Up. And um, so that's that's one thing that's coming up. We have a residency with the Craft and Folk Art Museum that is part of the After It Happened experience. So After It Happened premieres at the Ford Amphitheater uh, as part of their grand reopening season. And that is Friday, September 30th. So save the date. Be there Friday, September 30th at the Ford Theaters. That's After It Happened. And it's nine dancers and two musicians, plus (laughs) Hayosun. And it's a magical and amazing evening. And if you want to get involved in building the set and weaving your own stories into the set pieces that will be on stage. We have a residency with the Craft and Folk Art Museum, which is going to be really exciting. We're doing stuff around set design and storytelling through movement and uh, puppetry. And that happens towards the end of August. That is so cool, really getting the audience involved and being part of the (laughs) show more than just sitting and, and watching, but actually helping to build the sets that you'll be dancing and working with. That is so cool. It's going to be really, really fun. And, um, and again, like I think that break, the more you can break down boundaries between artists, you know, within different disciplines, between the artist and audience, any of these, these, um, the more you can really connect people into the worlds that we're creating, the, the better it is and the richer it is, because the more we talk to each other, the more we cultivate those connections, the, the better it is, I think. Mm. And where can folks go if they want to lend you their support? If they want to donate to the Invertigo Dance Theater, if, if what 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 would you recommend? How what would be the best way for them to get in touch with you? We are on the interwebs, so you can find us at www.invertigodance.org, and we would love to connect with anybody listening, anyone who has questions about the company can um, contact us uh, through the website. And, um, and we just look forward to knowing more musicians out there, knowing more composers, knowing, um, knowing anyone, because the bigger our community is, the more, the, the richer it is for all of us. Do you have any plans to do any interstate cross-city tours, perhaps coming to the East Coast where I'm located? Uh, we would love to. Anybody present, any presenters listening, you know, get in touch with me. There uh, you go. There you go. <laughs> in the meet. <laughs> we, we, we do tour uh, Southern California um, and uh, we are we are developing our touring program. Um, and I think that actually I, this is not like to brag or anything, but I think Invertigo would be an amazing company for a presenter to bring to their venue because we are able to connect with a lot of different communities. I mean, our education program is in place. Our Parkinson's program is really wonderful for engaging with different communities. Um, and the work itself is so, is so universally accessible that, that it really speaks to a lot of people in a lot of different ways. 
tell my executive director and my touring manager that I did my job. (laughs) (laughs) I give you A plus for that. (laughs) Laura, thank you so much for taking the time to share the amazing work that you're doing through the Invertigo Dance Theater Company. Thank you. It's been so lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. For links and more information on Invertigo Dance Theater and their upcoming premiere of After It Happened on Friday, September the 30th, visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter to get the latest updates on future episodes. You can also subscribe to A Musical Life through iTunes or with your favorite podcast playing app and get new episodes automatically downloaded onto your smartphone, tablet, or computer. If you enjoy these stories about all things musical and the things that move our souls, please tell a friend about this show and consider posting a short review on iTunes at amusicallife.com forward slash review. Thank you for your support. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.